Good evening. Welcome to the June 12th meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Uh, would you all please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Play the roll call from the town manager, please. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Councillor Grant. Here. Councillor Caitlin Jordan. Here. Councillor Penelope Jordan. Here. Councillor Catherine Ray. Here. Councillor Jessica Sullivan. Here. Councillor Sarah Lennon. Here. And Council Chairman Jamie Garvin. Here. Um, we'll start off with town council reports and correspondence. Does anybody have a report that they'd like to offer at this time? Um, yeah, thank you. I just have a quick one regarding the ordinance committee. We Our next meeting is tomorrow um, at 12.15. I think originally in the committee we had talked about being at 12. Or it's, it's on the um, website being 12.15, so it's 12.15 to 2.15, Jordan Conference Room, and we will be continuing to work on a draft ordinance um, as it relates to the legalization of marijuana. So, if you want to hear more about that, thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions for Council Brennan? Others? Councillor Lennon? Just wanted to quick reminder for um, people maybe watching from home that tomorrow is the um, vote on the school budget referendum um, open all day at the Cape Elizabeth High School, I believe, in the cafeteria. So don't forget to vote. Thank you. Any other reports or correspondence? Councillor Jordan? Um, I have a couple of things. Number one, um, I just wanted to let people remind people that we have a couple of really good community events coming up over the next couple weekends. First one, Family Fun Day, which is on the 17th, and um, it's always a great turnout there, and I hear there's going to be some wonderful fireworks. Um, the Cape Farm Alliance uh, does uh, the annual Strawberry Fest the following weekend, the 23rd and 24th, and um, on the 24th, um, the Comprehensive Planning Committee is going to have a table there, so it could be a great opportunity um, to kind of get an introduction as to what we're going to be doing relative to the uh, comp plan. Thank you very much. Any questions? Um, one thing I wanted to mention was um, you I'm waiting for report. other than finance, sir. Yes. Okay. Um, go ahead. Okay. Sorry. Um, I represent the town council and the metro coalition under Greater Portland Council of Governments, and that coalition has been working for a while now on developing uh, benchmarks for the cost of services on the part of regional governments, and hopefully that's going to be wrapped up pretty soon. And today I had an initial meeting uh, with uh, one of the Greater Portland Council of Governments officials and uh, I have volunteered to help the GP COG begin to explore initiatives to address the homeless issue in the Greater Portland region which is as you would imagine getting worse and uh, so I'm pretty excited about what this may, be, may involve and uh, looking at a housing first model out of Cambridge, Massachusetts is sort of the structure that we're going to be looking at. So, thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Council Sullivan? Any other reports from anyone? Um, I was just going to make note of, um, as most folks in town are probably aware, if you're a regular user of the transfer station and recycling center, there's quite a bit of renovation and work going on there currently. Um, appreciate everybody's patience as all this work is going on. Um, the net result is going to be a much um, you know, safer and more efficient operation when all is completed. But there is some information on the town website um, to help direct you around as the renovations are going on. And most recently, um, uh, it was noted that if you do need any assistance, uh, it is a little bit difficult to dispose of your household waste into the open container um, uh, uh, dumpsters that are there. If you do need any assistance, the, the staff is there to help and you can set things off to the side and they'll take care of it. So. Um, Hopefully we'll catch a stretch of good weather and, and keep the momentum going on the construction there. 
Um, but when it's all said and done, it's going to be going to be great and appreciate everybody's patience in the meantime. So, uh, if there are no other <coughs> reports, uh, we'll go to the finance committee report. Council Sullivan. Yes, thank you. You have your dashboard, I believe, in front of you. Um, and uh, some items I'd like to highlight, uh, as you may notice, the excise taxes are uh, doing extremely well, and building permits are at 187% of projection. So there's a lot of building going on, um, and so those figures are high. Uh, I have two other items I've asked uh, Matt Sturgis, the town manager, to talk to us about. The first one is our legal services. You know, we are we have spent quite a lot of money so far this year on those, and I thought it might be a good idea to find out basically what issues are we uh, paying for legal services for. <clears throat> Thank you, Councilor Sullivan. Uh, a couple different areas that we did have our, our primary expenditures have been since the start of the year have been uh, our primary focus has been on the medical marijuana uh, discussion. A lot of work with the ordinance committee trying to advise uh, the committee as to what its uh, rights and responsibilities are going to be related to the, the changing landscape of um, marijuana laws in the state of Maine that it happened. Uh, at the start of the year, so trying to reconcile that. That was one of the larger areas of concentration. Uh, also, there's been uh, quite a bit of work uh, with the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, there have been a couple of different hot areas there with a couple of different cases that have been going through the appeals process. And then finally, uh, there are other areas that, uh, that we had related to a, a building that needed to be looked at for uh, condemnation. Uh, and you think about the process working, that house that was condemned uh, or worked towards condemnation early in the year currently is, is in the process of being renovated and re rehabilitated completely with new siding and a number of the other areas being repaired. So the process has worked there. And then other areas that we have, I'm still waiting to see, uh, uh, there was some question related to uh, the different resolves that the council has been considering over the past, uh, past five weeks. And uh, we haven't received that bill yet from Monaghan Leahy, but we will be uh, close to or fully expending our, our legal, uh, legal funds this year. Thank you. And the other item I wanted to take a look at is uh, police overtime. I know uh, I, I asked you to look into that for us just because that, that's up. So. Yeah, police overtime, we are looking to be uh, close. We close to possibly exceeding on that overall number. Uh, and there's a, three different areas that we're looking at primary concentration is to driving us above the, uh, the overtime line. One is we had a, a Family Medical Leave Act uh, with an officer out due, uh, not due to uh, illness, but due to uh, good things such as the birth in the family. So uh, it's to be celebrated, but that, is, that does necessitate us having additional officer hours come in for coverage. As well as we had two uh, different injuries on, in the department. Uh, and one was uh, fairly substantial and it was for three months. Uh, but when you look at the overall budget for the department, we're at about 80, or we'll be at about 88% for this year. So the overall uh, uh, shape of the department's budget will still come in under budget. So uh, we should be healthy on that end. We just had a couple areas that seem to be closer to or, or tight to exceeding. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Silva. And lastly, uh, uh, to add to Council Lennon's announcement, uh, tomorrow is the referendum on the school validation vote, and that uh, school increase will result in a 3.1% tax increase to the citizens. And that, that's all I have. Any questions for Council Sullivan? Seeing none. Um, are there any citizens here that wish to speak on anything that is not on tonight's agenda? If not, if you intend to do so, now's the time. Please step forward to the podium. Anything not on tonight's agenda? Seeing none, go to the town manager's monthly report. Matt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yep. I know there's a lot of items on the agenda, so I'll try to be brief this evening. Uh, as both Councillor Sullivan and Lennon had stated, uh, please remember to vote tomorrow. Uh, voting will be held in the high school gymnasium. That was the only, only one change I had there, Councillor Lennon. Sorry. Uh, just had to switch just because the kids are still in school. Uh, so, uh, but that will be in the gymnasium. Polls open at 7 a.m. and they close at 8 p.m. Voting will be held on the school budget, a single bond issue by the state, and also to vote on filling a currently vacant seat on the Portland Water District Board. 
Uh, I recently attended the Greater Portland Council of Government's annual meeting, which was a fantastic event. I concluded my final year of a two-year term as president of GPCOG. The event was well attended with the plenary sessions on legalized marijuana, as all towns are facing similar challenges and questions, as well as a discussion regarding the opiate epidemic that, that seemingly everywhere is facing, uh, complete streets and other planning related issues. And as Councilor Sullivan had uh, spoken about Metro Coalition, tomorrow we do have a meeting at noontime at uh, Greater Poland Council Government's uh, offices. I had the opportunity to meet with representatives from the main Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry regarding the launch at Kettle Cove. Uh, we share a common interest in finding a solution to the currently failing or challenging public launch area on Kettle Cove Road. The original idea is to move the launch area approximately 50 yards north from where it currently exists, uh, where there was actually many, many years ago, for those who may remember, a launch or an access point that was there, but it has grown in and over. Uh, it works a lot better. It's less of a, of a perpendicular drop to the beach, and it's a nice gradual run to get, get to there. So it should be an improvement. We just need to work forward on the concept. I reported this information back to the Harvest Committee last week, who I met with last Thursday, and additionally, I have an extended an invitation to the state's representatives to come to the next Harbors Committee meeting on June 29th. They seem to be very uh, happy to work with the town and ambitious to find a solution on many of the different challenges that exist there. And finally, as we approach the end of our fiscal year on June 30th, our forecast revenues are arriving in excess of anticipated amounts, which is a good thing. And while our expenditures are in line to be slightly below anticipated amounts as well, which is a compound good thing. Uh, in July's council agenda, I will be bringing forward the amounts that uh, we'll be requesting to be carried forward into the next fiscal year. Uh, we have some paving and other challenges that we've been ran into this spring, uh, primarily due to the fantastically wet weather that we've had. Uh, so hopefully we can get a lot of that accomplished in the upcoming budget, but I'll have those itemized and ready uh, for the next council agenda. And that is my report, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Any questions for the manager? Okay, seeing none, uh, next item is the review of the draft minutes of our May 8th and May 15th, 2017 meetings. I'll be looking for a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Councillor Grennan, is there a second? Second. Councillor Lennon, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? It's unanimous, thank you. Our first item up on the agenda tonight is a public hearing on the proposed amendments to Chapter 24 of the Shooting Range Ordinance. I will open the public hearing in a moment. Uh, if you intend to speak on this issue, if you could please come up to the podium, state your name and address and or affiliation, and uh, the time limit for your comments will be approximately three minutes. I'll keep the time here and try and give you a little bit of a signal um, when your time is about to run out. So uh, we will open up the public hearing. Please step forward if you would like to speak on this. And thank you. If there are others, if you want to queue up behind Ms. Walter, that would be great to move us along. Hello, my name is Tammy Walter. Um, I live at 1095 Sawyer Road, and I'm the president of the Sparwink Rod and Gun Club. Um, I'd like to say on this occasion how much we appreciate the efforts of the Ordinance Committee, the Town Council, and our neighbors for all your input regarding uh, the revised shooting range ordinance. We believe after much discussion, review, um, and revision, the Ordinance Committee has found a sound solution and the result serves everyone. We urge the Town Council to pass the newly revised shooting range ordinance without influence or delay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, good evening, Eric Stefan is to Tiger Lily Lane. And um, I'd like to echo uh, the sentiment that the, the, uh, the ordinance committee did a great job in uh, clarifying and reordering the, the original the original ordinance, but there is uh, just one area I think deserves to be uh, clarified a little bit more, which is the question of the design of future structures to achieve 100% shot containment. Now, the intention uh, in the ordinance is very clear. In a couple of different places, it says that the 
uh, the shooting range facility will be designed to uh, contain all shots, ricochets, etc. And, um, and but the the mechanism for making sure that uh, that uh, happens, that that is achieved, I think, should be clarified further because the the design of the um, the, de the design of the facility is a very complex thing. It it, uh, it it requires specialized engineering expertise. I mean, when Mr. Uh, Rick LaRose was here a couple of years ago, he explained that it wasn't just sort of following a recipe for a facility. You had to take into account all sorts of variants, uh, such as the topography and the types of weapons to be used and the wear and tear of the ballistic impacts, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, there's only five or six, uh, according to him, only five or six companies in the U.S. specialize in this sort of thing. Uh, both because of the the, uh, the complexity and also the the uh, liability requirements. So I would suggest uh, that in, instead of burdening the uh, our code enforcement officer with, with uh, an almost I think an impossible task of, of mastering the, all these complexities and uh, and having to uh, understand the whole NRA uh, range book uh, range source book that we. Add in, that you add into the uh, into the ordinance a requirement that any design for a shooting range facility uh, prior to the reopening of the 50 or 100 yard ranges ought to be done by a uh, experienced uh, design firm which has expertise and a a demonstrated uh, track record in designing specifically shooting range facilities and I think that would uh, uh, you know eliminate any uncertainties as to whether the intention of the ordinance had been achieved when the design is actually done and presented to the code enforcement officer. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Kathy Klein, 66 Cross Hill Road. I'm also a former member of the Firing Range Committee. I just want to reiterate, reiterate what Mr. Stephanus said, that I'm hopeful that the council will consider adding a very small provision to the ordinance um, mandating an inspection if there's any construction done during the three-year licensing period. I'm fine with extending it from one year to three years, but if there's going to be any construction that goes beyond um, just cosmetic changes, I think someone who's um, knowledgeable in range design and safety should take a look at any construction that's, that's done during that period. So I'm just hopeful that you'll consider making that very small change to the ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Mark Mayhunch, Burnway Crown and Gun Club. Um, Mr. LaRosa's design that was mentioned earlier is actually based off of a industry, an industry known design that is actually prevalent throughout all the country. It's not actually picked out. There are not only, there are not six companies, five or six companies throughout the country that can now do this design. Actually, this design, now that it's public information, can be done almost by any engineering firm and is being implemented by many engineering firms. And there's actually some being done in this state, actually, at this moment. And so uh, I just want to clarify that it's not as specialized as, as it once was. Um, I think one of the largest fears uh, going forward here from our neighbors and other concerned people are the sound levels that are going to be uh, coming off of having a, another section of our range. And and can only say as far as that goes is we've had phenomenal success with our short range, which by far gets most of our use and is using, we are using the calibers allowed within our uh, permitting process um, right up to the largest calibers that are allowed in our permitting process and we're not having uh, many issues as far as as far as sound leaving the range uh, compared to what it was previously so what was heard previously is what you're going to hear what was heard previously before we started baffling will not be heard the same anymore. And we keep getting that evidence mentioned to us 
from people around the town who are saying, I just don't hear you anymore. Um, and that's on purpose. We tried really hard to do that. We're going to replicate that same exact thing as we go forward with the 50 and the 100. And also, as far as inspections go, we're very fortunate now. We just found an individual who actually does this in Falmouth. Um, and um, these types of ranges being more and more popular around the country. Um, so it's not as specialized as we think. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Can I ask yes. a question? Go ahead. So my question is, thank you for the short range. I think you guys did an amazing job. What, for the peace of mind of everyone involved in this, what is a guarantee that your 50-yard range will be as effective, quiet, and safe as your 25? Without writing it into the ordinance. Sure. Uh, as we go forward with designing the 50 meter range, 50 yard range, it's actually going to carbon copy the 25 yard range. It's actually almost an exact carbon copy of that. Uh, materials are going to be slightly different. We might use a little more absorbent, absorbent, absorbent materials, but the design itself is the same exact design, moved over. Like one more one more question. Is that true also for the hundred yard range? On the hundred yard, we have we have some things. We have some technical challenges to get over on the hundred yard. So we really haven't had. I haven't had a chance, and we really haven't had a chance to wrap our brain around the hundred yard yet. The fifth is pretty much consuming most of what we're thinking about doing right now. Final question. So, what would be the downside for you guys of having that that small thing added to the ordinance that would? simply guarantee that an ins a, a certified inspector would agree that it was as safe as it could be. What would be the problem in that for you guys if you're already intending to make it that and more? Um, the issue with that is is that we can get widely varying amounts of cost proposals depending on who we get for a quote unquote um, expert and um, one of our fears is is that uh, the club will be uh, strong-armed vis-a-vis uh, -vis the neighbors to end up picking someone who costs so much for us to have to bring into the state from out of state that it's going to bleed us dry. And we've kind of, you know, we feel as though that's kind of like an underlying strategy um, by some of the neighbors insisting on insisting on having experts where experts aren't needed. And our club has done very well at finding local people to do these jobs. Um, and that's, that's what we're most nervous about, is that we're, we're going to be blood dry with professional services where they're not needed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Ed Nadeau and I live at 9 Apple Tree Lane. And uh, first, I'd like to comment on Mr. Mayon's comment regarding noise. I have to agree. I think it's been much quieter. I suspect that's because they've been properly utilizing the uh, shelter that was built, well designed, and obviously properly built. I'm not qualified to argue whether it's a, a handful of specialized uh, specialists across the country or some local engineers could do it. All I know is that it's incumbent upon you to ensure the safety of our community. And I know the previous configuration of the board, I see some new faces you know, from the, this rewrite of the ordinance. The underlying requirement is still the same. Uh, whatever it takes to ensure their bullets stay on the range, our community remains safe. We're dependent on you. And whatever language uh, is necessary in the ordinance, again, we're, we're, we're dependent on your good judgment. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Are there others that wish to speak on this item? Last chance. Seeing none, the public hearing is closed. <clears throat> Next is item number 92-2017, proposed amendments to Chapter 24 Shooting Range Ordinance.
February 13th, 2017 meeting, this council had voted to refer to the ordinance committee technical revisions to the shooting range ordinance. That ordinance committee has completed its review and recommends uh, by a vote of three to nothing the proposed changes that are outlined with our agenda tonight in, in a memo dated May 1st. Um, Patty, would you like to introduce anything further on this from your perspective as chair of the ordinance committee? Um, if you'd like me to, could you want me to go back and review kind of the, the memo and all the changes, or do you think that we, I did do that the last meeting. I certainly, if you'd like me to go through them again, I, I'm prepared to do that. Um, it's, you know, up to the council. I'm happy to go through. Not necessary. I'm saying no. Is everybody up to speed? Personally, I don't think it is. Okay. 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 So, and that, would you like me to just put a motion on the floor so that we can begin dialogue and discussion on this, or what would you, how would you like to handle it? I'll entertain a motion on, okay. the, on the item. Okay, great. I'd like to make a motion to approve item number 92-2017, the proposed technical amendments to the shooting range ordinance. Thank okay. you. Is there a second? Second. Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Discussion, please. Right, Councilor Lemon. Um, I'm assuming while you guys were recrafting this you had a conversation about this issue that's come up tonight about inspections and ensuring that the range will be as safe as possible. do you want to just give us a quick debriefing of what you discussed and why you think that this does or doesn't address that adequately um yeah i think when we went through we, we spent a lot of time listening to the neighbors and the people who came and spoke we looked at the um the draft or the original ordinance itself and looked at and knew that with the, under the original license the language that was used was written as such to ensure that there, the ranges were to be safe and, and there was a conditional approval within the original license for those ranges of 50 and 100 and so we really just took the language that was there um, assuming that we would but making it better on how it would be um, uh, you know, as far as the, the walkthroughs annually and things that would trigger any type of safety inspection, which would be if they were to build a new range, having to go through the code enforcement officer. Certainly, um, I feel like um, Tammy and Mark have made really good faith efforts with talking about hiring the engineering firms that they have. They've talked about um, that they feel these are qualified people. They may not be the, the technical um, people that do shooting ranges, but there is shooting range knowledge. Um, so I, we felt like there was sufficient, sufficient um, um, substance in what was what was there to ensure that um, uh, and good effort made that it was going to be safe. To Council follow Gordon. up and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the 50 and the 100, I believe we we looked into it. And they're already approved mm -hmm. to happen, and and our code enforcement officer just has to go down and do the same inspections that he had to do in order for them to open up the 25. So they don't have any more hoops to jump through. We approved the 50 and the 100, and the same standards that apply to the 25 are gonna to apply to the 50 and the 100, whether or not anything more specific is written into the ordinance. And then we also added at our last meeting that we were gonna have annual inspections. So any additional nails they put into lumber are going to be inspected on a yearly basis. Other questions? I have a quick question. Um, as I was reading the, um, the memo that was um, mm -hmm. distributed dated May 1st, mm -hmm. um, on page three, um, there's number eight, legal review, and um, there's a statement in there that says that ultimately this letter suggests that the ordinance is legally valid and cautions the town regarding further regulations. Does anybody, can somebody explain to me the, the intent of that, the interpretation around that? Go for it, go for it, yeah, sure. So because of the state law that prohibits us from creating additional laws that will basically force the club from shutting down, the regulations that we've put in place get us just there without taking us too far. Because we can't create regulation that basically forces a situation where they can't operate because that's against the state law. 
So that's why it's, he's saying we have gone as far as we can without creating over-regulation that's going to kick the state laws into effect. Mm -hmm. Is that? Yep. I have another question. Um, thank you, Caitlin. I thought that that's what it might be about. Uh, the other thing to think about is um, small community organizations that have a large dollar amounts put in front of them in order to come into compliance with ordinances. And it looks to me like within the ordinance there's a um, uh, exceptions. So is there a period of time that an organization uh, such as the uh, Rod and Gun Club can take to uh, meet these ordinances because it could be financially challenging to an organization to get to the point of full compliance? So um, I'll answer that real quick. I think basically with the Spurk Ron and Gun Club had to spend about, I think it was about numbers about $25,000 to do all the things they needed to do to get their, their first license. So they are licensed. So that they won't really, they're not going to have to, should they follow, as long as they follow all they need to do, they're licensed, they shouldn't have to go through this process. That's why we set it up where there's a renewal without um, limitation. It'll continue to be renewed as long as they stay in compliance okay. with it. So if they fail to renew, then it would trigger the things that perhaps would cause some kind of hardship for okay. them. Um, but besides that, it shouldn't cost them nothing. Awesome. I, I was going to ask, could you clarify, or I don't know if either of the representatives from the Rod and Gun Club could, the, the note in the memo in the fourth point about the cost to prepare materials for the current license is 20, in excess of 25000 what, what does that represent? Is that, Excitement. that's not, well, go ahead. Go ahead. If, go, go ahead, Mark. Um, Mark Mallon, Sperling. I don't know if I have to do that for the record. Um, so if we have to do a site survey again, and if we have to go through an environmental survey, um, those are extraordinarily expensive issues. Those are just a couple of the surveys that we would have to do if we would have to relicense. Uh, Relicensing is considerably different than renewing. Relicensing means we have to go through the whole process again. So we would have to go through environmental site survey. We'd have to go through a, uh, a site survey itself. We would also have to uh, go through our water again. So let me just interrupt real quick. Sorry, sure. but if so, by just doing a renewal, though, you're not having to incur those costs. That's correct. So whether the renewal is at one year or three years, it doesn't matter then for the correct. cost. If, as long as you're just doing a renewal. Correct. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Other points of discussion? Anybody has questions? I, I have another couple of things. I, I'm just curious. Um, I know that there was... Um, so the, the point about renewal, I, I understand the intent of the change. Um, I, I, I'm not really clear on the material impact of having to do an annual renewal versus three years. I don't have any, I mean, I'm not, I'm not opposed to the three years, but I, I just don't understand how it's in any way a burden to have to just renew it every year, just like establishments have to renew their liquor license every year or anything like that. So I don't, I don't know if you guys yeah. want to share any thoughts on that, but. It was, it's basically all their renewal is they have to submit a letter to the Chief of Police that states that they are not, they have not made any material changes. And we looked at basically the fact that we're having an annual inspection go down every year. Why make them have to file this letter every year? Yeah. We'll just have the annual inspection and then have them have a three year. In reality, we also talked about why even have the renewal? Why not just give them a license and they have a license? Because if we're having an annual inspection, regardless of the three-year renewal... Well, when we do renewals of liquor licenses and things like that, people have the opportunity to come forward and if, they've, if they have concerns or, you know, there's been items, you right, know, we, so it would allow for that process. But. We talked about that as well, because people don't have to wait for the renewal. If you have a problem with something going on down at the Rod and Gun Club, I wouldn't wait until next October when their renewal date's up. I'd get right down to the police station and file a complaint. 
So the other thing that I would say just around the renewals is that there was also um, commentary about um, concern about without having written notification that the license was coming up for renewal, that there was risk of it getting lost in the shuffle. We, we had that actually happen already when it was a one-year renewal. Um, my personal opinion is that that likelihood increases when it's a three-year versus an annual because, oh wait, did we do it in 2017 or did we do it in 2016? Who's keeping track of that? Yeah. I so for me, annual would seem to be a, a more easily, you know, <laughs> keep right. in mind. But we did uh, agree that when they when they apply for the renewal, the letter would say when they, you've been renewed would give the date of renewal and the date of expiration, and we just suggested put it you know put it up on a wall and, and it, put it in meeting notes, whatever. It's the burden's on them to do that. Um, so we thought it was a fair compromise, but something that was in between. Um, you know, I, I, we just thought it was, you know, it, it wasn't un, uh, unusual. We've done it in other circumstances. I think they've done it with gravel pits and some other things that they've had done three years instead of, I, I, you know. I so. get that there's at least $25,000 of incentive for them to stay yeah. on yeah. top of it here. So, you know, uh, my hope would be that they would. Um, but um, I don't know. I, I, like I said, I'm not opposed to it. I just, I found the extension to three years versus one to be... Um, not necessarily helpful, that's, that's just my own opinion. But um, other comments from anybody? Okay. Um, seeing none, all those in favor of the motion on the floor, which is, let me just reread it for us, to approve the recommended uh, changes as outlined in our May 1st memo uh, from the Ordinance Committee having completed its review of the Chapter 24 of the Shooting Range Ordinance. All those in favor? Opposed? Passes. Thank you very much. Item number 93-2017 is the Good Table's request for a renewal of their liquor license. An annual review, in fact. <laughs> uh, is there a motion? Or, go ahead, Caitlin. I just have to disclose that my family does business with the Good Table restaurant. Thank you, Caitlin. Does anybody have a concern about Caitlin's participation on this issue? Thank you. I'm going to wait just one second while the gallery clears for a minute. Seeing uh, no objection to that, is there a motion on 93-2017? Council Sullivan. I move that we approve the Good Table's request for renewal of their liquor license. Is there a second? Second that. Councillor Kate and uh, Penny Jordan, sorry. Any discussion? Matt, are you aware of any concerns that have been registered in regard to this? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I spoke with the Chief this morning, and uh, there are no complaints or uh, outstanding issues that exist that, that should stand in the way of this renewal. And I see in the back a uh, representative from the Good Table. Is there anything that you wanted to add on this? Okay. Seeing none, uh, all those in favor of the motion to approve the request for renewal of the Good Table's liquor license? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Item number 94-2017, the local buzz requesting a renewal of their license and special amusement permit. Uh, is there, uh, does anybody have any business that they do that they need to? No. Is there a motion on, uh, motion on this matter? Okay. Patty? I move to approve uh, the local buzz's liquor license and special amusement permit. Thank you. Is there a second? Council Lennon, any discussion? Anything again, Mr. Chairman, that brought uh, to your attention, Matt? I spoke with the chief again this morning, uh, right after we asked him about the, <laughs> the good table. And again, no uh, complaints or, uh, or violations have been found. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. I see in the back somebody from the local buzz. Is there anything you wanted to add? You're good. Thank you. <laughs> Not at all. Uh, any other discussion? All those in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Next item is number 95-2017, the Maxwell Woods Multiplex Project. We have a request for a conditional municipal acceptance of open space and town roadway. Caitlin. I just have to disclose that I am uh, close family friends with the Maxwells or the Bamfords. Thank you very much. Any concerns about, uh, and I assume Penny, same thing for you? Same thing for me. Okay. Uh, any concern with either councillors, Jordan, uh, participating in discussion on this. 
saying none. Thank you very much for both of you. Um, is Matt, did you want to introduce this or something? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, I can, Thank you. I can do that. Before we, before we entertain a motion. Yes, sir. Uh, Maxwell Woods LLC is requesting conditional municipal approval for a proposed roadway extension and open space as part of the Maxwell Woods multiplex project. <coughs> The proposed open space is a total of 8.47 acres, and the roadway is to extend the Astor Lane uh, from its current terminus all the way through to the Spurwink Avenue. Uh, there's, a, there's also um, an additional agriculturally eased land that is uh, the part of the open space or part of the uh, conditional approval, and I believe uh, Owens is here tonight to speak on behalf of the uh, applicant to, to give us greater detail if that would be helpful to the council as well. That would be great. Now step forward, sir. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Owens McCullum, a civil engineer with Sebago Technics, representing Maxwell Woods LLC. Also with me is Joel Fitzpatrick, uh, who is the principal of Maxwell Woods. Uh, this project has been in front of the planning board and has received preliminary plan approval and as part of our process to move to final plan approval, uh, it's my understanding that we needed to uh, put a request in front of the council for a conditional municipal acceptance for open space in a proposed town roadway. Uh, the town roadway is from Astor Lane, which was developed as part of the Spurling uh, Woods project, and we will be extending that about 865 feet uh, to Spurling Road, which creates a through connection uh, the fire chief, uh, others have looked at it and felt that that would certainly be a benefit to make that connection because it's kind of circuitous in the, in the Spurwink Woods neighborhood. So uh, that would be offered uh, to the town as a public road. It will be designed to the town's road standards, which is a 50-foot right-of-way, 22 feet of travel surface, an esplanade, sidewalk, and street landscaping. And again, that's been through the preliminary review process. In addition, there will be uh, three uh, open space as part of the project. The first is a 1.52 acre parcel uh, that is located next to uh, existing town open space. It's owned by the town as part of the Spurwink Woods project. Uh, we would be offering this land uh, to the town to take ownership of that, that area, which will then expand upon the town owned open space. Another uh, open space is 4.8 acres. <laughs> another section, I guess I hit it. Um, another uh, section open space is 4.88 acres. That will remain in the private ownership of the association, the Max Woods. However, there will be a dedicated public easement for an access trail through that neighborhood to interconnect with other trails uh, that the town currently has in that area. The third open space is 2.07 acres, and that open space will actually be retained in ownership by William and Lois Bamford, who are co-applicants for the project, and that creates an uh, agricultural conservation open space area. In other words, um, the, Maxwell's, or the uh, Bamfords agree that that parcel cannot be developed, but can continue to be used as agricultural open space. Uh, that is identified as one of the top priorities in the town's comprehensive plan for preserving agricultural land. This is an, an opportunity to do that. I do have some graphics with me that I could pin up if anybody in, was interested. Uh, there was a plan with you. If, if the council wants me to, I'll, it's up to you folks. Yeah, better quality than one on. Okay. Probably. I have it on a pen drive too, but I'm not sure I know how to.
traffic shows it a little bit better. So this is the existing master lane here. It goes back up into the Spurling Woods neighborhood. This will be the extension, it's about 865 feet out to Spurling Road. So that would be the public road extension, uh, public sewer, water, uh, 22 feet of pavement, street trees on both sides uh, of the road. There will also be the 1.52 acre parcel that's around these multiplex units here. That's this area through here. And that will have a trail connection that will be constructed to connect to the existing trails that are within the Spurwink Woods neighborhood. The other open space is a one is a 4.88 acre open space that runs all the way down here to the edge of the property, up and around the development and around the fringe of the development. That open space, there's a trail that comes right now or will be completed uh, this coming year as part of the uh, Cottage Brook uh, project that was built with Spurling Woods. That trail uh, then will be uh, bounded by open space on both sides. There's about 50 feet of open, uh, well, about 25 feet of open space on the Cottage Brook side. There'll be another 25 feet of open space so that there's at least 50 or 60 feet now of open space where this trail connector comes through. There'll be a trail that runs down around the backside through this open space, up along the ridge that overlooks the Maxwell uh, farm, and then that will connect back to Astor Lane. Uh, then there's a sidewalk along Astor Lane, and then this connection that goes back up to the trail network here. And I've got another graphic that shows how this interrelates here in a moment to all of the open space in the area. This is the agricultural conservation, sort of the call it the darker green in this area. That is 2.07 acres. It has been agricultural land in the past, will continue as agricultural land, but it will be taken out of development potential so that it will remain as agricultural land or open space in perpetuity as part of the project. And then this is the Maxwell Farm Pond here, and then the Maxwell Homestead in this area here. I want to get to this. These are pictures of, of what similar developments look like. Um, so here is the Spurwink Woods neighborhood through here. Uh, this is the portion of Astor Lane that will be extended to Spurwink Road. This is all town open space and trail connections that currently exist in the area. So we'll add to that through here. We'll make a connection back over to here. And my understanding is that Town is currently working for some additional uh, trail connections on the Canterbury uh, project in this area and then I think there's another connection that's in the process across another parcel of land. So we're really building upon the open space that currently exists. In total the open space will be 46% of the total project area and again we're here tonight to seek conditional municipal approval. It's gone through planning board process for preliminary approval. We'll be returning for final plan approval once we complete our main Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions that the council may have. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, go ahead, questions? For Owens, before we get to a motion, go ahead. Um, is it typical for you, for an engineer or developer to come to the council for conditional approval? Yes, we've. Uh, I don't know if you folks are familiar with like the Eastman Meadows a condominium project down off Eastman Avenue. We did come in front of the council for conditional municipal approval for that open space also. And my understanding is that that is a, a, a requirement as part of the, the process. Can I ask you a couple of them? Go ahead. So I think there's been some questions about the legality of this, counting this 2.07 acres as part of the open space, because the our, our, our current town ordinance is drafted in such a way that it's supposed to be that agriculture or farming is supposed to be five acres, five contiguous acres. So my question is, if 
if it indeed is not legal yet, um, how can we grant conditional approval if then it has to wend its way through a very thorough ordinance process and that the people who are in charge with doing that decide that in fact this proposal is not legal, what happens to our conditional approval? Uh, a couple things around that. One is uh, we've looked hard at this. We've actually had um, our attorney from Jensen, Barrett, Gardner, and Henry Lee Lowry look at this. And, um, he believes that it is legal. The, the five acre question is five acres, part of five acres of contiguous or uh, part of a, of a larger area that totals five acres, and we're well over that. So it's only two acres of the Maxwell Farm that's being put in conservation open space, but it's still part of a much bigger agricultural use. So um, and we've been through this in quite depth with the planning board, and I. I am not familiar with, I, I heard that it was going uh, for some further discussion or clarification within the ordinance, but my understanding is, is that this is part of a larger agricultural area that is over five acres, so therefore it is legal. We're just dedicating this particular two areas, this particular 2.07 acres as uh, agricultural open space for this project. But, in totality with the Maxwell Farm, it's over five acres. I mean, my final point is my reading of it, it says it has to be five acres of the open space that's contiguous, i.e. touching each other. So you don't get to count the space next to it that isn't being designated as open space. And the, and the purpose of that, I think, is that it doesn't get chopped up into little bits or made long strips that don't meet so, the spirit of what I think the ordinance was trying to get at larger chunks of open land. And I could be wrong. I'm just, I guess it's a hypothetical question. How can we grant conditional approval if there's a lot of ambiguity and, and a lack of clarity around this question? If that became, if, if for whatever reason it became determined that this two acres couldn't be agricultural conservation, then we would just roll it into the overall open space of the project and become part of the overall project. Again, what we were trying to do was preserve agricultural land so that the Bamfords would have that opportunity to continue to gain some financial gain from this project, but still be able to operate their farm. And that is the intent behind this agricultural open space. It helps farming is identified as a important, as a, as a strategically important uh, component in the comprehensive plan and the Bamford's farmers is no secret farming is a difficult business to make money at this project will generate some funds also will allow the Bamford to continue utilizing that agricultural open space so we saw it as a win-win for the farming community and I think the Bamford's law would also argue that that certainly is the intent and provides it so that they can keep using that land as part of their overall farm, but yet get a benefit, a financial benefit. If we comes down to it and the legality says it has to come out and be part of the uh, the project as open space, so be it. But that would be a sad. That'd be sad for the Bamfords because it was trying to recognize the value of agricultural open space. So, final question: If we give conditional approval and you continue to build things based on the fact that this is going to go through, i.e. a road or more units or whatever, and then it goes through the ordinance process and it's found to be not legal, what happens to that building and those structures that have gone in? Well, there's no buildings or structures that will be on that agricultural open space, but then we would simply change the model and make that open space part of the uh, Maxwell Woods Association, but no longer be conservation open space. It would just be dedicated open space for the condominium. And that would meet the 45% requirement? That would be 46%. We need 45, we have 46. Again, we were trying to have a win-win for the farming folks so they can continue to use that land for farming and agriculture, which has been identified as an important uh, goal of the comprehensive plan. Um, I, I have a question that uh, perhaps you can answer, or if not, uh, uh, town planner, but 
I interpreted this when I was reading this as, as essentially a transfer of development rights. And am I correct? I would have to defer to the town planner for okay. the technical terms and, of that. Um, and so I, you know, and it seemed that with some of the emails we were getting, and I was trying to sift through things, and I appreciate the emails we got late in the day. I was not able to read them, but I certainly appreciate that effort to get us that information. Um, so I, it, I, I just need a little clarification, probably from the town planner on the process with ordinance and the change in terminology. I mean, it seems like it's a transfer of development rights, which I don't think has occurred very often in Cape Elizabeth, and that may be part of the confusion. Um, I certainly understand, you know, the benefit to the town as well as uh, the Bamfords for doing this, but if, if Maureen could give us a little of the, clear up some of the semantics. <laughs> so, so I, you're right. This. This looks a lot like transfer of development rights, and it is the spirit of transfer of development rights without having to go through all the mechanics of it. So if you were going to actually do transfer of development rights, you'd have to do the calculations differently. You'd have to transfer from one property to another. And because the properties are right next to each other and the developer is purchasing land from the Bamfords, um, it seemed a lot simpler to just uh, treat the Bamfords as a co-applicant. So they're almost like part of the development. And the developer was asked to provide a revised application form. He did so. The application form says that both, um, I don't remember which LLC this is this time, but both the developer and the Bamfords are co-applicants. They both sign the application form. That's in file, on file in, in the town office. Could you address the, the I don't know if you've had a chance to see the several emails that we received. I have. Would you address those concerns? Because I, I, you know, I was trying to read through those. They came in today, too. And we certainly, you know, you know, the, the elephant in the room is, is this spot zoning, which it does not appear to be at all. But that, you know, I think was one of the messages we were getting. And so I, I just need a little clarification on that. And I don't understand also, I, I was a little bit unclear as to what the downside is for this, for anybody, including the neighbors, other than are we switching, changing terminology in our ordinance at an appropriate time. So correct me if any of my thoughts are. And, and I can speak at length, and if anyone who saw the planning board meeting heard me speak at length, and um, a lot of the comments that you received were also made to the planning board, and it, in, even though they heard those comments, they decided there was enough information to move ahead and grant preliminary approval to this project. So um, it is not anywhere near spot zoning. There's no proposal to change any zoning at all. It's, this land is in the RC district. It's going to stay in the RC district. So that's, that's not even uh, part of the issue. There is, uh, and I have two pages that I will skip over, of documentation of how long the town has been working on planning efforts to preserve agricultural land starting in 2007. So I uh, can go through that in depth if you have the stomach for it. But going ahead to the, the subdivision process, the, any subdivision that is more than five lots or units or has substantial infrastructure has to be a major subdivision. So, and, and the ordinance says that this, the major subdivision is actually the two-step approval process. There's preliminary approval and there's final approval. And so this project has received its preliminary approval. It has not yet submitted for final approval. And one of the small wrinkles of the difference between a minor subdivision and a major subdivision is that for developers of major subdivisions, they must come to the council and obtain something called conditional municipal approval. Honestly, it's really not worth much. I mean, I, I think of conditional municipal approval as an opportunity for the planning board and the council to make sure they're, they're working on parallel tracks. The, the project touches base with the council and says, here's the roads we're laying out, here's the other infrastructure we're proposing, looking like we're in the right direction. 
And if you grant municipal approval, all it means is that looks like it's okay so far. It's not an acceptance of any facilities at all. Uh, once the road is built, once the project is fully underway, that's when developers will come back to you and ask you to accept the road, ask you to accept the open space. That's when you get to look at deeds and make sure everything is T-crossed and I-dotted. So the, the example I gave earlier today is I do know of a community several years ago where um, it was routine for the planning board when they reviewed stormwater for there to be a detention basin created, which is a perfectly legitimate way to handle stormwater. But the downside is, once you create a detention basin, someone has to take care of it. And at that point, the council said, okay, we don't want you to do this anymore. We're accepting this one, but we're not going to accept them in the future. So what conditional municipal approval does in Cape Elizabeth is it allows you to kind of touch base with that before you're presented with a fait accompli, you basically got to take it and you say don't do it in the future. So that's kind of the function of it. Does that answer your questions? Did I leave anything out? Uh, no, I think that, that takes care of it. Thank you. That's good. Other questions for Maureen while she's up there? Can I, can I ask what may be considered a dumb question for the um, engineer? So the 4.88 acres that is designated, mm -hmm. um, I, I presume it's been looked at, whether or not another 0.12 acres could be eked out somewhere or to get to the five continuous or? Okay. We've pretty well maxed it out as much as we can. In fact, we're over, we've, we're slightly over what we're obligated to have by the code, which is 45% of the project needs to be open, open space. No, I understand the total percentage of the project, but I'm talking about the continuous acreage. That's um, no, the, uh, the, the, the 4.88 is, is open space land, whereas the 2.07 is the question is the, on the agricultural side of it. Oh, yeah, maybe I didn't understand the question. Yeah. <laughs> okay, maybe I'm conflating the two issues then. So yeah. Can you clarify? Yeah. Yeah, so, the so the argument that, some, that people are making in the emails is that the farmland part of it has to be five acres, not 2.07. The 4.88 acres that's going to stay with the condominium association, that's good. That pretty much happens all the time. The 1.52 that's going to be open space given to the town, that's another thing that happens all the time. The biggest question is the farmland and whether or not that needs to be five acres or if we can just take... 2.07 acres and call that farmland, put a farmland easement on that small but lot. And that's what we got our fun four page letter from the attorney. Okay, I misunderstood it to be that if there were to be agricultural use, that you had that also, that other open space had to. Mm -hmm. it, okay, got it. It is confusing. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Council. Well, and then so, so fine interpreting correctly then in order to go ahead let's just say if this was all you know completed and approved that 2.7 acres would still be farmed and they would then have enough of their of their existing farmland which they are retaining to still be within state law because that's a correct. state that's statute that's correct, correct. okay Right. If we could it just, this, this just allows them to make more money and still preserve this land and still farm it mm -hmm. should they correct. choose to. They don't have to, but they, they might they choose They can sell to. it, but whoever buys it has to can't farm it as well. It. Right, yeah. they can't develop it. Yeah. yeah. And they're currently um, using it as farmland right now? They are. Because that was yes. one of the big questions people saying it's not being there, used. I, I mean, I, I don't know if they use it this past year, but I know that uh, talking to Joel and the Bamfords, they have use that as agricultural land. They have planted on it in the past. Uh, sometimes they rotate crops, so some years they may not do anything, another year they might, but they have historically used it and they plan to use it again. Could you just show us, uh, I don't know if we can see it, but sure. where does that connect to, is it Stevenson that goes into it towards Crowded, Crowded Brook and like kind of the north side up there? Oh wow, okay. I mean, <laughs> So, Aster, where does Aster Okay, this is go? this is Aster Lane here. Uh -huh. It goes all the way over to what they call South Street. South. And then it comes out to here. 
and then South Street comes down, there's a stop sign intersection right here, and then this is Burwink uh, Avenue that goes up to the Ocean House Road and the traffic light. Stevenson's the elbow that comes in to Spurwink. Oh, right here? Yeah, because you've got the stone wall no, on South Street that's there. Spurwink. you got to take a left right. on Hamlet. The one that comes perpendicular into Spurwink? That's, that's Stevenson. That's Stevenson. Okay. And then, and then South so Street's there, through to Right, there's South, South, South Hamlin. Yeah. Right. you got to take that left turn. Okay. 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 I, I just seem to recall we had some issues in the past with that and the Astor Lane on um, when when that development came through, I just... I think there's a gated... Right. Right Yeah. There. Yeah. Oh, anyway, side issue, but thank you. Thank you very much. Sarah. Sure. I have a question for the manager. Matt, do you know, Matt, what... This is designated, this 2.07, in tax rolls, and when the last time it was actually used for farming? Because isn't that just a storage place now? Still is. Well, I was looking at the aerial photos. I guess I can, I'll try to answer two questions. Maybe don't in, in reverse, if that's okay. Yeah. But looking at the aerial photos, you can see that there was row crop production up in the back corner that you can't see from the road, but it has been tilled and it has been in production. That being aside, it's never been enrolled in the farm and open space classification uh, that's under tax law. So it's been assessed as if it's back land. So if you had two comparable parcels, let's say, the remaining uh, Bamford land is 12 acres. If I had another piece across the street that wasn't enrolled, they'd be assessed in a similar fashion. So probably the two acres in the back is, is assessed as if it's back land uh, and has been like any other parcel that, that isn't enrolled, if, if that helps at all. So it's been you know, not as much as the primary acreage would be, like your base house lot would be. So you'd have your primary lot would be your house lot. So let's say it's one acre. And then the next few acres would be assessed at a much lower level. And then the next few acres beyond that at, a, at an even lower level as the larger units get out there, uh, the, you know, the concept of diminishing returns costs less and less the larger the volume is. Uh, that being said, there has been some confusion about the five acre business, especially regarding uh, the farm and open space. Uh, there was some discussion about the farm and open space law from the taxation side, Bulletin 20 I think it is, was discussing that. And five acres is the bare minimum that a property can have to qualify to be in the farm program. You could only farm on one acre of that five acres. Or you could farm on, you know, if somebody had greenhouses, you could do that pretty simply on a half an acre. You just need to have a minimum of five acres. The other four could be covered in barns and, and houses or pavement for that matter. But if they had five acres, that's just the statutory requirement. So looking at this parcel that the two point, I don't know if this is 2.7, 2.07 acres, is part of that larger parcel that remains, which does meet the threshold of the five acres. Uh, you know, the, the income side of it is related specifically to the farmer. It doesn't, it may not have to be specifically from that area, but the farmer needs to show that, you know, with everything they have, they might earn $2,000 per year, two of the three or three of the five previous years. I, I don't think that's a concern. In, in this case, but again, the, the Bamfords have enrolled in farm and open space on other parcels in town. Uh, strawberry fields in particular are, have done that and specifically sit within that program. Uh, met, and as I said earlier today in an email to council was a uh, you know, farming classification, at least enrolling in the program has been the exception and not the rule in town and partially, and that's partially due to the fact that withdrawal penalties are fairly significant when you do come out from that. Uh, but that's a whole other, as I say, a whole other area of discussion. But the five-acre business, it it does seem to meet that requirement because it's still owned by the Bamfords and it's contiguous. Um, Even though it will now be co-owned. Yeah. The uh, yeah, 38 exactly. and does that, MRS that does say... I'm just concerned we're going to get sued yeah, no, I, I, and have to foot the bill. If we I are can. expending uh, legal uh, legal expertise to, to get it clarified, but I think, uh, but I think based on them, I think it's... Title 36, 1101. Uh, Item 3A says that an application or, uh, may be made of more than one tract as long as the tracts contain five acres, contiguous acres. So it says specifically in here, yeah. an application may be made for more than one tract as long as one of the tracts contains five acres. So their homestead acre, their homestead is well over five acres. 
this track is 2.07, but I, that's why we keep, you know, it's right in the uh, 36 MRS 1101 to 1121, so it can be more than one track. So probably worth double checking that it can be two, and you technically can, two different owners. Yeah, and there, you can even find within within the law the interpretations, but even if they're, you know, if they're separated by a road, they've even taken that interpretation that they can be, as long as, the, you know, Farmer A owns both sides of the road, they can even include that in there, but uh, that's about the only area that they allow that contiguousness to be defined as, but but overall that's, yeah, they could have one acre here and four acres next door as long as they come to the magic number five. Councilor Jordan? Because to make sure I understand and to clarify, this whole five acre business, $2,000 within the year, that is only if you want to apply and register for a state of Maine tax farming incentive program. It has nothing to do with if you just want to grow vegetables. It's if you want to enter into a program. Otherwise, there's no other farming requirements other than if you want to enter these four programs, which we're not even talking about at all with this project, correct? Correct. Just yeah, making exactly. sure I got that straight. Right. Now, Sona. And um, as I understand it, the easement sold would be held by the town, correct? Yes. The town would hold that easement. So one of the emails expressed, at least one anyway, ex that I saw this morning, expressed concern that, gee, what would happen in the future, you know, if the town holds that easement. So I wanted to confirm that, yeah, it will. And my thought to that is the town, you know, holds easements on a lot of open space um, and, and also uh, in connection with Greenbelt Trails. And the town has always maintained for and even fought for its maintain, maintenance of its open space and Greenbelt Trails. So I, in response to that individual, I, I don't have any qualms at all about or concerns about the town retaining that easement for perpetuity. Mm -hmm. Any other perpetuity is the right way to say it. Any other questions? We still don't have a motion on the floor either, so uh, I want to make sure we get all the discussion down here, but um, to clarify any points particular to the, the specifics here. But. Just the last thing, you, you had said earlier in the thing, if, if you weren't able to, you gave conceptual um, approval of this, and then you weren't able to use the agricultural easement, there, there's another mechanism that you could use, you still could get the open space, right? So regardless, we, yeah, we would ultimately end up it's with the open happen. space. Yeah. Again, we were just trying to be, to recognize the importance of the farming that the town has put in the ordinance, and we thought it was a good thing for right. the, mm -hmm. for everybody. Right, so the questions, I think, they're coming up because people want to leverage making um, maybe less buildings and those kinds of things. Regardless, if we approve this, it's you're still going to get your open space, and you're still going to remain with the same number of buildings. That's why I think it's, it's happening. So, okay. All right, are there any other questions that people have for engineer or manager, planner? Okay. okay. Uh, is there a motion on this matter? Council Sullivan. I move that we accept the request for conditional municipal acceptance of open space in Tom Roadway with the Maxwell Woods Multiplex Project. Is there a second? second. Council Pennington. Any discussion? I know we've just had a lot, but any discussion? Seeing <coughs> none. All those in favor of the motion? Opposed? It passes. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here and clarifying a lot of that information. Thank Appreciate you for your time. it. Yep. Item number 96-2017, a request for authorizing a printer, photocopier, lease purchase agreement. I saw Kathy Messmer here earlier. Is she still here? Yes, she is. Kathy, do you want to come forward? I can tee this up for you as well. Well, she comes forward if you like. Oh. What the town is what we're looking at doing is a lease purchase agreement for new uh, for new printers and photocopiers for the for the town office and for the school department, and the town has gone through a process in order to examine and and, and see what's going to work best for us for for uh, for providing those services, and Kathy's also worked at Bitterford Savings Bank to get 
uh, favorable terms involved with the lease purchase of this, and she can now detail uh, what we have going forward. So thank you, Kathy, for being here tonight. Not a problem. Um, I did get quotes from three different banks on interest rates. Uh, it was Androscoggin Bank, Gorham Savings Bank, and Biddeford Savings. And Biddeford came in at the lowest rate of 2.66. So um, as Matt said, this is to finance the town's portions of new printers and copiers um, that we are purchasing. Any questions for Kathy? <laughs> Council How Jordan. many do we get for that much money? You know, I thought I was prepped for this, and that is one answer I can't tell you. Um, we are purchasing between the town and school. We're purchasing, if I remember correctly, about 55 machines. And copiers run around $3,000 um, yeah. each. And we're primarily going with copiers because they are definitely much more cost effective than a printer. So. And just the, the lease purchase, it's a five year, so I mean, we're leasing it for five years and then we own it at the end. Yes. So something happens within the five years, you know, we get a replacement plan. We, um, one of the things we do when we uh, sign up with a copier company is part of the agreement is that if there is an issue with any of these copiers, they do replace it for no additional cost. Sounds good. So oh, go ahead. Uh, what what was the mechanism by which we purchased the equipment that we now have? Was that with another lease purchase agreement or, um, or, outright or It was another lease purchase agreement. What they did, this was five years ago, and they didn't, um, they only bought, I don't know, I think it was probably... I honestly don't know how many pieces of equipment they bought, but that was only on the school side, and they did try to reuse a lot of those copiers, and um, it's been kind of problematic at this point. So what we did is we cut back on how many machines we have, but we're going with good quality ones that will last us for the five years, um, and that, is, as I said, is more cost effective too. Councilor Brennan? Oh, that was this part of the, in the capital improvement plan? Have they planned for this? Or is this we have been price? planning for this. We have yeah, been, okay. Yeah, we have been. And uh, I will say, part of the, uh, as, as Kathy said, we are looking at being more cost effective because, as you know, if anybody has uh, uh, laser jet or inkjet printers, uh, it's like the Gillette form of marketing. It's not the razor, it's the blades. Mm -hmm. And those things will kill you as far as cost effectiveness. So, with these larger copiers, they actually, the functionality is greater. So we've been able to, over the years, eliminate things like fax machines because we can now scan an email and, and, and smart fax through those machines, as well as the, you know, the price per copy you know, on the color on the black and white side is phenomenally low. So uh, we're, we're trying to maximize them both. And then also the more functionality within departments, you can have more users onto one larger machine versus everybody having you know, these little cost eaters on your desk. And as Matt said, um, they all the copiers can scan, and they all scan in color. So that is that is actually makes it easier. The resolution is very high, so it's very much easier to read an item that's scanned on the new machines. Any other questions for Kathy? Seeing none, is there a motion to authorize the printer photocopier lease purchase agreement as outlined on our agenda? Councilman. I move that we authorize uh, the Catherine Mess with the business manager and no, uh, wait a minute. The manager. Yeah. And the town manager, I'm sorry. I don't know his name. <laughs> to uh, enter into a lease purchase agreement with Bitterford Savings Bank. Is there a second? I'll second that. Council Grandin, any discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathy. Appreciate Thank you. it. Thanks, Kathy. Next item is number 97-2017, a resolve welcoming all people. Um, we took this up at our May 1st and June 5th workshops. The consensus at our June 5th workshop was to place a version submitted by Councillor Penny Jordan, which is included in tonight's agenda, um, and was amended from her original version on May 1st uh, for consideration on this uh, on this agenda. So we have that as well as, um, as we discussed at the June 5th workshop, two other versions. One, a revised version from the Cape Diversity Coalition 
as well as another version submitted by Citizen Victoria Bolin. Both of those were to be reviewed, uh, if possible, following the June 5th workshop by both Chief Williams and the town's attorney, um, with the intent being that if councilors um, uh, had intended to make any amendments, proposed amendments to Councilor Jordan's that is on the table for consideration, that both of those would have gone through a similar vetting and review uh, with the purpose of potentially um, leveraging some of their language. So, uh, that all being said, I will entertain a motion on uh, item number 97-2017, resolve welcoming all people. Is that a motion? <coughs> Council Lennon. Don't we have a 15-minute opportunity for citizens to speak before every agenda ends? Um, we have, having ha already had the workshops on this, I wasn't anticipating further public comment tonight, but... Jeff, isn't that a rule we have? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if anyone wants to speak, but there seems to be a lot of people. Yeah. Sorry, I was just saying, I think... I just want to check the rules real quick. I thought our rules allowed for 15 minutes in public. Okay. It is a rule. Okay, so fair enough. If there are people here wishing to speak on this item, uh, please come forward at this time. We can have a up to 15 minute discussion period. Uh, ask that you limit your comments to about three minutes per person. Identify yourself by name and address or affiliation if you could. And I'll give you a signal uh, when you're approaching the end of your three minutes. So if you could step forward to the podium, please. And if there's anybody that wants to join in this, please queue up behind uh, at the podium. Chairman Garvin, could I just ask for a clarification? Um, the last time we talked about this issue, um, the, uh, the folks in the audience didn't seem to be able to control their emotions. And I would like to read part of the council rules, if I could. Mm -hmm. um, it just takes me 20 seconds. Yep. Um, these are council rules, and I just want to make sure that we all understand them. Persons present at council meetings shall not applaud or otherwise express approval or disapproval of any statements made or actions taken at such meeting. Persons at council meetings may only address the council, the town council, after being recognized by the chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Please. <clears throat> My name is Walden S. Morton. I live at 387 Mitchell Road, and I brought a letter in by hand this morning because I didn't think I was going to be here because my house was supposed to be roofed, but it was too hot. So I'd like to read my letter to the council, if I may. Please. <clears throat> Excuse me. Dear town council men and women, we have received copies of the three proposals being considered tonight to express support and concern for the well-being of all new members of our community. We enthusiastically support your efforts to take an official stand in writing, offering support to all new parties coming to our country and our community. We have been reading a lot about these issues and learning from the regional excellent group welcoming the stranger. Three points. All levels of government and private citizen groups now need to articulate their support because the newcomers have been repeatedly insulted, frightened, and threatened, directly contrary to what the United States stands for traditionally. We were all new except the native peoples of the continent, and our Constitution welcomes all qualified to apply to become American citizens. Two, one reason for this negative behavior is fear and suspicion of the other. In times of terrorist attacks worldwide, acting out of fear is so contrary to our ideals, it must be overtly opposed on every level by every citizen. We are not three, excuse me, three. We are not expert in legal wording. All 
three of the proposals would seem adequate to the task to us, so we are comfortable with any. We did not attend the other hearings, so we yield to those tasked with this effort. Knowledgeable members of the Town Council incorporating advice they have received from expert new residents of our community. What we do not support is silence. What is needed is courage in the face of wrong behavior and flawed leadership. We strongly support taking an official position. Thank you, Walden S. Morton and David N. Morton. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ann Clark, 350 Ocean House Road. Um, I am not a founding member of the CDC, which is the Cape Diversity Coalition, which is not a political organization. I've heard it said and read it that it is, but it is not. I joined in progress. At the point I began to attend meetings, one of the early discussions was whether this was a community issue or a school issue. We quickly realized it needed to be both, but in my mind it belongs in the community for what are schools but a reflection of the communities they serve. It is concerning to me that the school board saw fit to pass a similar resolution and yet the town continues to struggle. This resolution merely articulates for our community the qualities to which we all aspire, namely to be beacons of decency and kindness in a world that has become increasingly uncivil and unwelcoming to those who are different in any way. We offer this resolution for two main reasons, to provide care and protection to any of our citizens who are experiencing discrimination or being made to feel unwelcome in our community. And yes, I do believe it is important to name the groups of whom we are aware that are currently being made to feel unwelcome. Otherwise, there is no recognition that there are some citizens that are more at risk than others. And to encourage a dialogue among all Cape residents about what it means to be a welcoming community. For many years, Cape has been a relatively insular place due to geography and the demographics of the time. Like the rest of the country, Cape's demographics are changing, and for many of us, this is a major shift. It requires an awareness of what it is like to be new or different in a community. It means reaching out to those who are marginalized or new to make them feel safe and welcome. It requires our entire community to be woke to what it is like to feel unwelcome and to actively work against that. We very much hope that our resolution fosters a more conscious spirit of inclusion in the Cape. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Paul Seidman. I live at 21 Oakview Drive. Uh, I too came into this group sort of midway through and um, learned a great deal about some of the things that have gone on that I just wasn't aware of. Um, and so I just want to make a case for um, the CDC version of the resolution, um, in part because they're all so similar. Um, I just want to note uh, one of the differences. Um, through the long process that you embarked on uh, towards passage, um, we took into consideration a variety of comments uh, from the council. One of them, uh, I believe from Kathy, was that um, to be sure it was inclusive, and we rewrote it uh, accordingly. Um, Penny put in a great deal of time and effort with us. She met with us. Um, we had several conversations about how to hone our document to make it appropriate. Um, as you said, it's been vetted by the attorney and by the police chief. Um, and I want to um, note, taking off my hat as a rabble rouser and putting on my hat as a friend, that uh, I'm Nasser Shear's friend. Uh, I'm a friend with his sister. I'm a friend of his daughter's. I'm getting to know the family. And I think it's important that the resolution that's passed is the one that most speaks to them, that is the one that they recognize as supportive. Because to me, that's the point of the document. And to choose one that isn't, or not that, it, not that it's a bad document. I think all three are strong, honestly. Um, but to choose the one that is not the one that feels right to them, I, I don't see an argument for that. And I hope that you will support uh, the coalition's version. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, counselors. Uh, Jamie Wagner, 30 Hannaford Cove Road. Um, as several of you might know, I'm, I'm an attorney and I, I spent a lot of my practice with asylum seekers who are seeking asylum in the U.S. Um, I, I have a lot of 
firsthand experience with uh, prejudices and discrimination against mm-hmm. asylum seekers and people of different uh, countries of origin. I want to thank, uh, offer thanks to the chair and the town manager for the open door they've had during this process. I want to give special thanks to Sarah Lennon for bringing this to the council in the first place. And I want to thank Penny Jordan for her thoughts and efforts on addressing this issue. Um, and I'd like to thank all the members of the Cape Diversity Coalition who spent many, many hours on this issue and on other action items um, that will help show the greater world the ideals of our town and that our town is a, a town that welcomes diversity and condemns hate speech against minorities. I agree with what Paul just said and other members of the CDC that a more specific resolution is the preferable one. Um, I'm not the target of racial um, taunts. I'm not a victim of racist or religious or gender bigotry. So we should speak to the people and those specific minorities that do suffer those discriminations. And uh, finally, I want to say this shouldn't be a really hard resolution to pass. And I, I think I've heard that from all of you, whether, you know, whatever version it may be. I think the, the Diversity Co- Coalition's resolution is the most poignant. Um, and I encourage all of you to use your leadership position to take a stand on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm the Reverend Timothy Boggs. I live at 12 Oakhurst Road. I'm the rector of St. Albans Episcopal Church, but I'm speaking on my own behalf rather than on behalf of the parish. First of all, thank you for all the work you've done on this issue and, and everything else you do. I know sometimes how thankless that can be. This challenge and even the controversy that may be associated with it are really rich opportunities for us as a community and for you as leaders. You're given a distinct chance to say right out loud that this is a community that values the dignity of every child, every person, every strain of humanity. Thank you for all the work you've been doing to refine it and to work on it. The, you know, when you're a caregiver, or a pastor or a community leader and you approach someone in pain, you, you ask, where, do, where does it hurt? And it's for this reason that I encourage you to spell out in good faith the classes of people who are so often in our culture victims of the special pain of discrimination. In our caregiving, let's be the ones who ask, where does it hurt? And when we do this, we see that those, it's those named in the coalition resolution that the herd is so often delivered. I don't think we need to, be, to fear naming the places of the people where the bruises of life have fallen, especially bruises that have been delivered in fear or anger or violence or hate. I come from a tradition of values that's completely coherent with this American tradition of ours of stepping up to real problems, naming them by name, addressing them clearly. It's a practice grounded in truth-telling and in genuine hope. And I know it's essential to true healing. It's what we teach our children and we pray our families and communities will embrace. So I encourage you not to miss that opportunity to be specific, to go where it hurts. Thank you. Thank you. Maureen Clancy, 11 Hemlock Hill Road. I'm a volunteer member of the Keep Diversity Coalition. And I was the person who clapped, and I apologize. Sometimes I can't control my passions. I will try better next time. So I want to speak on two issues today. First, the issue of of why we take up this resolution. And our coalition brought this to your group just as many other communities across our state and nation have brought this to their towns. Because of a recognition in our current times, things are happening to marginalized populations that we need to name and address. 
when there are problems or issues in our communities, and not to say they're specific, you have to name them before you can be specific to address things. Without naming things, without bringing this forward, then we're ignoring that things may exist in our community. The second piece that strikes me of the three resolutions, and of course I'm in favor of the Cape Diversity Coalition, is the issue versus equal versus equality. To me, the two of the resolutions seek to create, to be equal, to make all of us equal, to, which is a wonderful ideal. What our resolution seeks is to create equality. Sometimes to do that, it's not even. It's like if you took, put three little boys across the fence trying to see a baseball game of different sizes. If you give them all the same size block, they still can't all see. Sometimes you have to give some a different size block. Sometimes you have to give a little more so that they have the equal access. That's what our resolution is seeking to do. By naming them, we're letting them know we recognize them. We're letting to them know that they're welcome. And I think that's essential in today's time. I'll just leave you with a thought. For what I always teach when I teach about equity, equal is every child has a pair of shoes. Equitable is every child has a pair of shoes that fits. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, this is your beloved Afghan, American, Muslim male, Muhammad Nasser Sheer, who lives at 41 Ocean House Road for the past 20 plus years. The first speaker who came up here, my wonderful, wonderful teacher, Lenny Morton, who was my high school teacher, taught me the world how to speak English, more or less. So thank you for coming. Just to show you how long I've been here as well. And thanks for Sarah reminding the councils to give us our three minutes. And if I do go over three minutes, I think you owe me this for the last workshop we attended. My mouth is dry. My stomach is a little bit hungry. I've been fasting since 3 a.m. And I just broke my fast with the water about five minutes ago. So please forgive me if I keep wetting my mouth with my uh, soul. I'm here, I'm still here, and I'm still seeking your spiritual support. Not your legal support, not your political support, but just for the morales. <coughs> that is my medicine. These people are my medicine. These are my pills. These are the energy that gives me here to live in your town, in this town, in this country. They give me positive energy. I want to be felt welcome here, not by your vocal words, but by your written words. No, I will not hold these words against you or others. I'm a geographer, I make maps. I'm not a lawyer, I don't make lawsuits. Just for your information, particularly for those who have not attended this before, this whole thing started, my sixth grader on the bus, when Donald Trump was elected, was told to go back where you come from. Of course he was born here. My daughter, 10th grader, was told indirectly in high school, now that we have a new president, now that we have a new president, our Muslims will be deported. Those were just the two incidents. There was another incident that you are aware of that happened in the football field. There was another incident that happened to a lady on a bus going to a sports team, a person, a gentleman, a male, saying some negative stuff about a female. I made to see this resolution to prove to my kids that there is hope, that there is democracy, and the democracy does work in this town. I want to, we want to take the negative energy and turn it around to a positive energy. We worked so hardly with Penance Resolution on months and days by a number of people. 
and we edited more or less Penny's resolution. So we hope that that resolution will pass because I am proud Afghan, I am proud Muslim, I am proud immigrant. And that is something that no one can take away from me. So whether you approve it or not approve it, that's who I am. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Tom McCulka, and uh, I live at 6 Arrow Point Road. And um, I just want to quickly just ask you to think. Uh, all three, I've read all three, I want to come back to that question of specificity. And what you're attempting to do here tonight is certainly worthwhile, making a statement. But just think about 10 years from now. If someone were to look over the town meeting and say, look at the resolution that was passed. And they would say, well, that's a, a well-meaning statement, the one that is primarily being considered, the one without the specificity. What was going on at Cape Elizabeth? What was going on in Maine 10 years ago that they felt that they had to write something like that? I don't know. No clue. Oh, but there, another resolution. Immigrants, refugees, asylum seekers. People in pain. Cape Elizabeth stood up and recognized those people. That document will live. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to come forward and speak on this? Seeing none, thank you for your comments. We'll, uh, I will entertain a motion on 97-2017 to resolve welcoming all people. <clears throat> I'd, like to make a, I'd like to make a motion that um, having been the author of one of the versions and having uh, scrutinized each one and um, compared and I would my motion I would like to put forth that the uh, Cape Diversity Coalition's uh, uh, submission be the resolution that we as a council seek to adopt. I'll second that. Council one and seconds. Is there any discussion? <laughs> Councilor Wright. At the at the um, at the chance of being the one person in the room that has some other things to say, um, I don't disagree. And I said that before, I don't disagree with the people in the room and what they have to say. And I do appreciate uh, Ms. Clancy's um, comment about um, apologizing, because we did get an email the following morning, and I, I think she was upset, and that's okay. We get lots of people that are upset. Um, I am concerned about the disconnect that I see with this issue. And I'm not saying that I won't support a resolution, but I'm concerned about the disconnect. Um, we were first told that there was an incident at the schools in the fall. When we asked the superintendent, he couldn't verify that. He said, I'm not aware of that. Okay. I was a little concerned about that. I was concerned that the schools were not addressing this. Now, somebody said today that the schools um, passed a resolution well after the council was asked to pass a resolution. Um, and so uh, I, when, when the schools, when I, when it, I think it was Councillor Sullivan said um, that the superintendent said he didn't know about the incident and um, so then we're going, okay, well, what's this about? The Cape Diversity Coalition brought the resolution to the town council and I stated before, and I state again, that I'm concerned that it leaves out folks, like seniors and others. In fact, we got emails from people saying, wait a minute, you've left us out. Um, and we feel left out. Okay. So that made me think, if we make a list of who we are being accepting of, are we not always already leaving other people out? I think we are. Um, 
there was a town councillor that said that the Cape Diversity Coalition was doing good work in the schools. The superintendent was asked about that, and he said he wasn't aware of that. I, I don't know what to make of that. Um, and I was, then I was concerned that, are they, aren't they? If the superintendent doesn't know, um, what's that mean? Um, are the parents aware? Um, I got a little concerned about that. Um, so then um, there was somebody that said, and I have my notes, that said that the Cape Diversity Coalition started after the presidential election in the fall. And I said, and I will say again, that the town council is a nonpartisan group. I felt, and I still feel, that there is something that is political about this. Um, we have, the town council has to be careful. We can't take political sides. We're all probably registered something, but we can't take political sides. So I still do feel that there's a piece of that. Um, my biggest concern was at the last town council meeting. We heard from several students who said they had been bullied at school. Frankly, I want to use other words. I will say I'm very concerned. I was more than very concerned. Because they're coming to the council and saying, we were bullied at school. And I'm saying, what's the school doing about that? What is the school doing about that? Maybe they're doing something. Maybe they're not. Um, but it was really upsetting to have students stand up and say they were bullied because they were Muslim because they were female, because they were gay, because they were Jewish. That's horrible. That really is horrible. And I find that appalling. Um, I was on the school board for eight years. If I was a school board member, and maybe they did, I'm not saying the school board didn't, but I would have had those students and their parents into the office the following day and found out what is going on because that is not okay. Um, so I'm very concerned. Um, the other piece, and this is why I said something at the beginning, we had students tell us that they were being bullied. Then we had people in the audience cheering for the people that they thought were representing them. Do you think that that's bullying the council? I do. We got emails that were a little bit something. Is that bullying the council? I think so. You know, you don't want to be bullied. People want to be accepted. Well, there's people with differing opinions. You don't bully the people who disagree with you, and that includes the council. Having said that, I've lived in Cape Elizabeth since 1959, probably as many, as many years as most people in this room. I have not found Cape Elizabeth to be unwelcoming, but if there are people that are feeling unwelcome, then I think we should do something about that. But I needed to say what I need to say because I think it's important. Um, and I can see that there's people now that don't agree with what I'm saying, and that's all right. That's okay. So I will support a resolution, but I will not support the Cape Diversity Coalition's resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Is there other discussion? Council well, I'd, I'd like to ask Council Jordan why she's changing her mind and why she would rather support the Cape Diversity Coalition resolution than the one she submitted? I would say that I haven't changed my mind because I have always supported a, the resolution. What I did say, uh, and I said this when I met with the coalition, that uh, my whole premise is about uh, inclusion. And if you can create a resolution <laughs> that achieves uh, the objectives of uh, inclusion, 
And at the same time, um, and I'm not saying that I, I do not um, uh, work in a, you know, in a way that classifies people, but if there are people who need to, and as I listen to people speak tonight, if there are people who need to have uh, specific uh, labels or words in order to define the statement, then I can go there. But they've achieved my goal. And my goal was about inclusion. And when I read through all of these, and I, I actually dissected them, and um, so I went through and I said, did it achieve, did it achieve what I had set out to do when I uh, developed the uh, resolution that I put forth? And it does. Is it the 6-6-2017 version that you, or the 6-1? 6-6. 6-6, okay. Thank you. <clears throat> um, before going to Council Lennon, um, Kathy, I want to thank you for your comments. I'm not, um, I'm not looking to challenge you on them, but as a point of fact, I just I have a distinct memory from when Dr. Coulter was here on the first. As a as a matter of fact, that I just wanted to try and clarify. Others may remember it differently. My recollection was that uh, Dr. Coulter stipulated to not knowing specifically matters of discipline that had taken place as in regards to any of these items at the school. I'm pretty sure that he was aware of them having happened, but couldn't speak to us that night on matters of discipline. So I just wanted to clarify that as people consider. That was my recollection. Others may have remembered it differently, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's what he stated. But Okay, yeah. thank you. Then that also concerns it's, me. <laughs> it, 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 yeah, and I'm, I'm not sure at what yeah. liberty he would have been able to speak to matters of discipline in an open meeting like this anyway. But um, it, it, I'm, I'm nearly certain that he had awareness to the, the actual actions having taken place. Councilor Lennon. I think that this was originally perhaps sparked a little bit by those few incidents in the school, but I think it's gone way past that, and it's not really about that anymore. Um, I too was concerned to hear about those few. I had the distinct impression the school was doing something about it, but with all the conversations we've had since then, we've learned that this is not um, this is not just about kids in schools. This is happening in our adult community in town, um, unfortunately. And in some regards, it's even bigger than that. Essentially, what we're trying to do is um, step up to an opportunity to um, join with people across our county and our state and even our nation to speak back to forces of fear um, and unfortunately violence and hatred. Um, and so for me this is much much bigger than a certain few instances that happen to have occurred in our schools. I think this is an opportunity to be our better selves. Um, and I would be happy if we passed any, but I agree with all the speakers tonight who said that it's much more powerful if it's specific. I used to be an English teacher and, in fact, just dipped back into it. And over and over on papers, you just keep writing, be specific, be specific. I don't know what you're saying. You need to be specific. And there's such a power in specificity. That's why good fiction has imagery and metaphor and simile. This speaks very powerfully to the time and place we're in right now. I don't think it's political. I think it's much bigger than political. I don't think it has to do with partisanship or party. I think it has to do with actually a worldwide, um, very frightening retreat into um, groups or us versus them that will take all our power to push that back. Um, so for me, this has gotten bigger, and I think that it's aspirational, and I think that it's um, a really great chance for us to stretch a little bit and maybe take a risk, but um, in the best way possible in general. When people take risks, it usually ends up being a great thing, and I think many, many more people have come here and spoken to that than, than the reverse. In fact, I'm not sure I can remember anyone saying that they, except one email, that they, they weren't in favor. So. 
I'm personally in favor of the CDC one because I think it's the most powerful and timely and um, just, just, just a more powerful result of all our hard work. But I won't be unhappy if we do another. Thank you. Councilor Vernon? Yeah. You know, when we first began having this conversation, I, 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 right from the get-go, I was in support of um, the CDC, which is nice to have an acronym, acronym to use, um, version. And, and when we heard the stories about the things in the school, um, at that time, um, it obviously felt like it was a very incapable of I truly believe it's a very, very small dark spot of this, although um, statewide, globally, it's so much bigger. But any spot is too much. Um, today, it's interesting, I spoke with a friend earlier today and was thinking about our, what I now feel like is kind of your, our watered down version of this. Um, I came in here prepared to make a motion to do, um, to um, ask for the Cape Diversity Coalition to be put up. I, I didn't have to do that because Penny, you did it yourself. I just feel like the, the other one, um, it's just a vanilla, it was an empty soup. It just, just left me without walking away feeling like we had done something purposeful. And I think it's important to know that it's, it's important to call out, to make it specific, to call it, you know, all the different classes of people so we know what we're, we're um, supporting and what we're doing. Um, you know, name the groups who are all minorities, and I think it is inclusive. I think they did a good job of putting together all those people so that is not exclusive of any particular group. Um, and importantly, those that feel um, the prejudice and feel like they're excluded. So um, I will be voting for um, the motion on the table, and I'm really happy that this is where we're landing in the dialogue. Another discussion? Councilor Sullivan. Well, you know, I've been reading everything and reviewing everything, and I, I think that, that there continue to be some issues with this. Honestly, it feels fluid. I'm not exactly sure where I'm going to land tonight, but I think this is political. I, it certainly started with the school department, and to your, your point of fact, uh, you know, regarding Council Ray's statement about the superintendent, the way I recall, he, he, you know, he relayed the incident last November. He was not present, and what he did say, to my recollection, was he wasn't there. He couldn't, re you know, he wasn't aware of all the aspects of it, but he did, you know, confirm that it had taken place. What he did say was there had been no disciplinary action, nor even counseling on the part of the offending students. I found that to be very surprising um, that we would be asked to support a resolution when the school department itself had, at that, by that point, not, not addressed this. Um, no discipline, no counseling, no school assemblies to talk about inclusivity or bullying at all had taken place. Now, since then, the school board has adopted a, a, another version of Cape Diversity Coalition's uh, resolution, a different one, a different one that was presented to us. It wasn't the same resolution. I mean, I, you know, this, it's, this is very tough because I think we are in a very, as counselors, in a very interesting p position. And I have very mixed feelings because I do not feel that getting involved in national politics is the purview of local government. And the elephant in the room is, I believe, that this is a statement about the current administration. Now, I support the, in the sentiment completely, completely support it. I would like to ask the council to consider if we were being presented with a different resolution from a different group from a prior administration to say, well, we don't like what's happening in Washington, and we think that you should be affirming X, Y, Z. I wonder what the reaction would have been at the prior administration. And conversely, I would say, we don't know what the council makeup is going to be in five years from now and 10 years from now. We don't know what the atmosphere in Washington is going to be at any point in time. And it's almost to be careful what you wish for because you could conceivably have something occur in a resolution that, that people here tonight would be very much opposed to. 
And part of my thinking or attempting to think logically about this as, as something that should the council actually be doing is to look at that, to say if we go down that road. Now we've had uh, resolutions in the past and um, the town manager upon request looked into that history. The resolutions that we adopted in the past dealt directly with council function, whether it be setting budget, tax rates, uh, uh, confirming and implementing a green belt plan. Um, and this is quite different. This is quite different. And as I said in April, in the words of Martin Luther King, you can legislate behavior, you can't legislate morality. And so people are saying, well, you know, this is obviously, this is something very important we should do. And again, I agree with the sentiment, but I really am worried that this is not the purview of, of council. <coughs> We are nonpartisan. We are local government, and I'm, I'm really worried about going down that road. We were admonished in April by a member of the, the Cape Diversity Coalition that it's up up to us, the town council, to model for our town's children. Again, when the school department had done absolutely nothing about the incidents that occurred, um, I, you know, and, and to Mayor Council Ray, I mean, I was appalled at what our some of the students told us when they were here. You know, and yet, again, at that point, nothing had been done. So now there have been a couple functions that have taken place since then, which I think are terrific. I think the again, the, I I completely agree with the sentiment, but it, it does it does concern me that while people may want to think this is a great thing for us to do now, we don't know what future councils and governments in Washington might be doing and. You know, we don't know what those results could be, and you know, you say, well, that could never happen. Well, you know, maybe it could, and that worries me. And and I think that's one of the reasons why we don't want to go down political roads. So I'm not ready to vote yet, but that's where I am at the moment. House Gordon, I agree with most of what you're saying, Jessica. Um, I think this started out very political, and that is the elephant in the room that this has to do a lot with politics, but what I see before me, whether you're on one side of politics or on the other side of politics, this is as straight and narrow as you can get. If you're not on board with these principles, then I'm not sure where you stand in morality. I mean, because it's, we've trimmed it down to make it so that this is what we should want our citizens to be doing. Everybody should be nice to everybody. It's as simple as that. You learn it in kindergarten. Um, and it's my understanding, and I agreed with you right up until tonight that I wasn't sure that this is, you know, something that the, the council needs to be taking up because you're going down that road. But I don't mean to take away from the words that are on this paper, but it's also my understanding that, and I mean this not to come out the way it is, but this is kind of meaningless. I mean, it doesn't mean anything. You want to change it next week? We can. You, it, there's nothing you can take to court. I look at this from a lawyer's perspective, and I'm not taking this document to court and saying, he was mean to me because the council passed a resolution. It's just a statement saying, let's be good kindergartners and be nice to everybody. And I, and I don't mean to drop it down to the humor, but it's just my sense of humor that my poor father raised me with. And, and so, I'm comfortable with this. You know, we can, let's move forward and, and let's get this statement out there that we, we welcome everybody. So it says at the top of the page. Councilor Gordon? Yes, um, I just want to um, address some of the statements that uh, Councilor Sullivan put forward. If I think 10 years from now, or uh, 20 years from now, or five years from now, uh, this statement to me is not a political statement, it's a societal statement. It is the basis of how we interact as human beings. I don't care who's sitting in Washington. If we as a town uh, uh, look at this and say it's uh, politically charged, 
then what we're saying is how we treat each other is defined by who's sitting in Washington, D.C., and it is not. Um, I'm, I think what has occurred is that um, issues have bubbled to the top, but these have always been there. Uh, they, they will be there five years from now, ten years from now, etc., because we're all human beings who interact with each other in different ways. My ideal would be that uh, we all look at each other for the strengths that we bring to the community, for, this, uh, for um, how we create a better place for uh, children, all of that. It's not politically charged. It's about human beings and how we want human beings to interact. Other points of discussion? Um, I want to reiterate um, from my own perspective um, a point that I've been making um, from the get-go on this and that um, I just at a fundamental level do not agree that this is simply a school issue. I agree that there was a spark and some tinder um, that ignited it um, with some incidents that happened at school on at school or on school property um, but as I track this I, I've seen um, it broaden in scope to be a far more um, uh, holistic and, and and more encompassing matter um, it does concern me if there are things that have happened at the schools that have, have gone insufficiently addressed and, and hopefully um, either it's things that we're just not aware of or, or things that will be addressed in the future. Um, the greatest concern I had, um, frankly, in my role as chairman uh, as it pertained to this issue um, and I expressed this quite directly when asked um, by a member of the Cape Diversity Coalition who brought me an original version of their draft a week before it coming on our very first workshop to discuss this. Um, and even probably going back before that, I remember iterating this to both Matt and Dr. Coulter. Um, it concerned me that I was very, I was very afraid of the of the negative um, light that our community would, might find itself in, were we to get down a road where we were having discussions like this, um, where there there was perhaps not as much un, uh, unanimity in support of a measure, because um, frankly, I think while a very healthy debate and one that I don't discourage in terms of um, you know, letting people have their differences of opinion, which is fundamentally what some of this is all about. Um, from an outside perception standpoint, it just worried me that, that um, we would unfortunately be painted with a negative brush. Um, and and I, I think that maybe for a, a couple of the folks on the council, um, I can certainly appreciate that um, that uh, sort of popular sentiment, if you will, for lack of a better term, you know, it, it's unfortunate that it, it, it backs some of us into a corner um, relative to our own beliefs and everything. Um, but that not being, you know, that notwithstanding, we are where we are in terms of where we've gotten to on the debate at this point. Um, the last point I'll make um, is um, I agree with you, Jessica, about because um, I've sort of held a belief all along on this that what's the harm? What harm are we doing by any of these versions? What harm are we doing? Um, and I had a very hard time finding any, um, I expressed at the last workshop in response to Caitlin um, that there's you know, clearly uh, the potential, uh, I think it unlikely and the low potential given that this is a rather unique circumstance, but there's clearly the potential that um, you know, future organized actions could be brought forward to try and get us to take or render, you know, render a motion or a, a resolution on something else. So when you were talking about, Jessica, the, um, the past resolutions that we've had brought to us, um, 
you indicated that they all had to do with a specific council function, which I agree with. Um, I was just thumbing through the, the town charter here, and while it's not enumerated in Article 2 that lays out all the duties and responsibilities and qualifications of the town council, I do think, though, that one of our most fundamental functions is that of providing and modeling leadership for the community. Um, and uh, it, is a, it is often, as in the words of the Reverend, on, on these very difficult things that you need to stand up and, um, and, and be that beacon of leadership. Um, so for that reason, I'm in support of any of these. I, I do have a little bit of a concern that with the laundry list of people in the second section of um, the Cape Diversity Coalition's um, version, while well-intentioned, I think there, there can be a point where when you list so many people, the, the power of any of those individual um, groups or names or words can, can diminish somewhat. I, I have no opposition to going with that version, um, but I'd be happy with any of the three of them. Um, but it's for those reasons that I think that this, this is something that we um, should be taking action on and something we should be voting on, and um, I appreciate everybody's perspective on it. Uh, that they've offered tonight. So, is there any other discussion? Okay. So, see, go ahead. Well, Council Leonard is being provided. Go ahead. I was just going to say that there's a motion on the table and we, we should yep. vote. But, um, I mean, I'm sure we all have more comments, but I could talk at length why I don't think it is political, but whatever. I think it's, I actually think it's just time to vote. We've discussed this. I don't want to. I don't want to disrupt. Uh, I don't want to pull the. I don't want to put an end to the discussion if people have substantive things they want to continue to add. Though I, I don't. Don't feel like. And we. Please, if you have more that you want to add, I'm happy to entertain discussion on that. So, Council Sullivan. Yeah. Um, you know, this is going to go right down to the nanosecond for me, but I would like to say that. Uh, it's been very interesting. This is a very small group that has come forward with this resolution. I don't. I, some, some have said this is a huge town-wide movement. I see no evidence of that. It doesn't discount what they're doing, which I think is admirable, because I do completely support the sentiment. I think that um, uh, the Cape Elizabeth, Cape Diversity Coalition certainly does not <coughs> need the town council to promote its views. It's free to do this, and however they want to do this appropriately. I, uh, I think that um, I appreciate the apology we received. Uh, I certainly consider that I have been bullied in the interim because I dare to say something like, I'm worried about how this will affect the town in the future. Um, and I find it very interesting that some individuals are trying to promote inclusivity and to, to uh, speak out against bullying, and yet I feel that in certain occasions, and, th and this has happened, uh, certainly me, that as a result, if I don't agree with them, then I, it's okay for them to bully me. <laughs> so I find some of that hypocrisy quite disturbing. I think that as counselors we have uh, uh, a responsibility to be concerned about uh, unattended consequences. This is an interest group and we are being asked to affirm their views and again I agree with the, the intent by, by the sentiment but you know it does concern me and I think that I, I certainly hope that the schools will be proactive in dealing with the issues that have occurred, they apparently hadn't been, you know, uh, because the superintendent couldn't tell us about anything that had taken place. Um, the one thought I had is they, they uh, this coalition group has has gotten the school board to affirm one of their versions, um, and so I thought initially I thought, well, okay, fine, you know, and and they still feel the need for the town to do so. Um, I, you know, and so again, I, I've just got some concerns. I, I was more interested in um, uh, affirming Councillor 
Jordan's version myself because uh, she made an attempt to avoid classification. And, um, and I could be supportive of that because initially, you know, we had left people out and that's something that happens when you try to, to name certain groups. And so I thought, well, okay, if I'm going to support something, uh, I certainly want to make sure it's inclusive. I do think that Cape Elizabeth is an inclusive community. You know, as far as the council is concerned, perhaps with the exception of Council Jordan, I, I don't know. I've lived all over the world. And I, as a military spouse for years, have had tremendous experiences living next to all kinds of people. And uh, my kids are bilingual. I, you know, I, I, I don't know. I just, you know, I think that uh, we have here in Cape Elizabeth a, a, a very warm community. I don't think that a resolution will prevent things from happening in the future. I believe that these teachings begin at home. And again, you know, I'm, I'm worried about the slippery slope. I mean, I may end up supporting it. I don't know. But I'm highly conflicted because of the, the reasons I've, I've mentioned. Um, so I just wanted to say that extra piece. Is there, um, uh, is there a, well, it seems like everybody's in favor of the Cape Diversity Coalition one and not Council Jordan's original one. We have a motion on the table, so we would have to vote for that, and if it goes down, then we could consider, but I think we should vote for the motion that we currently have on the table. Now, I think. had I had, had the police chief and the town attorney were reviewed the 6-6 six, six version? Yes, yep, they've, uh, they've been able to review everything that's been submitted up to this point. And, uh, yeah, uh, the attorney specifically came back and said that they found no issues as, uh, you know, we had in the first one, was, which was yeah, changing the defend to respect, and then but ultimately uh, found them both acceptable as well as uh, Chief Williams. Councilor Jordan. Just quick, everything you just said is where I was before I came, and I was prepared to vote for pennies when I got here because I, that was the one I was more comfortable with. And so once she made that motion, not that I was ignoring everybody else, but I was reading through the CDC's one for the fine tooth comb, and for whatever it works, work to you, you know, I looked it over and looked it over, and I have come to terms with that it's acceptable in the fact that all we're doing is saying, you know, let's be nice. You know, it's, we're not doing anything more. It's not putting anything into action. It, you know... I had concerns that we were going to have be flooded, and if we're flooded with people wanting us to make policies, then we can say no. But right now, it's, <clears throat> it's just put a step forward. Councilor Grant. And Jamie, don't you think, I believe, if, if this is going to have, the attorneys have said there's no unintended con consequences. It, it seems like when you look at the charter, our, our role is to be leaders, it's the right thing to do. And then you end up with, um, you know, every council is going to have something, and they're going to make their own decisions, no matter what we do here. So I, as much as you want to you say, you know, geez, we're starting something that could be affect the future, and I understand where you're coming from on that, every council is going to be making those decisions. So I just think it's, you know, looking at what's here, it's the right thing to do, and that's why I think we should support it. Any other discussion? Seeing none, the motion on the table is to um, is the resolution submitted on 6 6 2017 by the town council to the town council by the Cape Diversity Coalition, welcoming all people into our community and is detailed and linked in our agenda. All those in favor of the motion on the floor. Opposed. Motion passes. Thank you very much. We'll give a minute for the chamber to clear. Thank you for coming. If you have any discussion, though, please take it outside the chamber. Thank you.
Okay, our next item on the agenda is number 98-2017, approval of the placement of a sculpture at the... You guys ready? 98-2017, approval of the placement of a sculpture at the Thomas Memorial Library. So moved. <laughs> Kyle, thank you for being patient and waiting here tonight. If, did you guys want to come forward and... If you want me, I can, I can give you a brief answer. Sure, thank um, you. The reason why this article is up here tonight for council consideration is because there is, uh, we need to have council approval to, in order to place an item on town property. As uh, you know, back in May of 2016, the council approved to, uh, to uh, uh, receive the structure from Thomas Mall <laughs> Library Foundation. Okay. And uh, at this point in time, uh, Kyle and Greg Marles, when he was here, uh, got together with Maureen and Ben McDougall and also spoke with Caroline Jordan, the chairman of the planning board, and identified the location where they want to site the, uh, the sculpture at. Uh, they had the sculpture lined up to, uh, to be created, and, uh, but now we just need approval from the, from the town to do that. Caroline uh, Jordan has approved that because it's within the confines of our ordinances. She has the ability to review that due to the de minimis change that takes place uh, with this. Uh, that's why Kyle is here this evening. Is, uh, I don't know if you have, have any questions for him, as well as uh, representative from the Thomas Moore Library Foundation. Thank you, Matt. Is there a motion? I move that we <laughs> approve placement of the sculpture that was gifted from the Thomas Memorial Library Foundation. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Penny, thank you. Any discussion? Wait, can I just ask a really dumb question? I tried to look at the map, but I couldn't understand because it kept saying prior library. I just want to know where the thing's going. <laughs> awesome. So Thank I can picture. Yes. Um, so as you're looking at Scott Dyer, you have the uh, driveway as it's coming up off of Scott Dyer Road. When you get to the building, right there on the edge, there's the brick patio that faces Scott Dyer. Then there's grass, and then there's the parking lot where the two handicap spots are. It's going in that grass square. May not be a perfect square. Um, right between that brick patio and then the parking lot where the handicap sculpture. Thank or, I'm you. sorry, handicap parking is. It's gonna look nice. Any other questions or discussion? Nice. Seeing none, all those in favor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Next item, number 99-2017, year-end budget shortfalls. Mr. Manager. Yes, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is mostly in line as a housekeeping item. Uh, as we're getting close to the end of the fiscal year, June 30th, uh, we're looking at reviewing all the different accounts we have. The one area that we're really pretty tight on was on our community services uh, youth program. We're at 99% of expenditures on that right now. Uh, overall, we're, we are in good shape, but just in order to make sure that we don't override or overspend that account, just looking to make an appropriation change of ten thousand uh, dollars. This is consistent with what the councils have done consistently in June over the years, just in order to kind of get us through till the end of the year. Uh, overall, that that the community services budget is is very healthy, but just that one area, as we're getting close to the end, uh, it's getting it's getting tight. But okay. that was the reason why I uh, made the recommendation, just to make that one appropriation change. Thank you. Uh, is there a motion to approve the recommended appropriation? So moved. Second. Councilor Grennan, Councilor Jordan, discussion. Councilor Sullivan. Um, is this a uh, is this a revenue program? In other words, these kids pay. They do. So yeah. So what? Why do we have this big shortfall? One side is expenditures, and one side is revenues, and uh, so it, it that will balance out. But uh, some. I guess we're getting towards the end of the year for Kids Club, so a lot of that has already been spent, but we're just, we are just really close. But our revenue side is very solid. And it's kind of interesting because the way that they structure the summer programming and other different programs, there are early uh, benefits if you pay, uh, like if you pay for the whole program in now versus paying weekly or bi-weekly or whatever over the season. So they get a, they're actually front-loading a lot of the revenue that they have, so we're going to show a larger growth side on the revenue side on the youth programs that we may have tracked in years past because they are being wildly successful and they're almost full in all their summer programs as well as aftercare and before care uh, programs that they're going to have for the upcoming school year. But a lot of that's being paid for now so uh, it's just a question of trying to make sure that we 
on the expenditure side, don't override that. Whereas on the revenue side, we are showing a will show a bit of a bubble as compared to where <coughs> a year ago. But they don't they don't balance specifically uh, within within there because one you know we've got two different columns. One is your 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 debits and one is your credit. So how much uh, have we <clears throat> ultimately? I mean, this is right. I don't, you might not be able to answer this, but subs we're subsidizing this. Or will after the fiscal year, considering that the programs are continuing and they're, you know, they're summer yeah. programs as yeah. well, does that come back? That, that comes out. Yeah, that it'll, it'll, it will balance out over the course of the year. Yeah, very well. Like we may show it. <coughs> we may show that it, the revenues far exceed what our expenditures were at the end of the year. Uh, however, uh, you know, next year it'll yeah. It, that's a long-worded answer to say it balances out <laughs> over the course of the year. Thank you. Sorry. Too much Kathy. Any questions? All those in favor of the motion to grant the appropriation? Unanimous, thank you very much. No citizens here remaining for any topic that's not on the agenda. So seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Council Lennon, second. Second. Councilor Pen uh Kayla's actually flipping you guys tonight. Uh, all those in favor? Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you.